And then today is about Zacchaeus. Do you know Zacchaeus? Anybody know Zacchaeus? All right, so this is a Sunday school or vacation Bible school test. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A little man was he. Let's go. He climbed up in. If you know the motions, go for it. Let's go. Lord, he wanted to see. Come on. Come on. I see you out there. The Savior passed that way. He looked up in the tree, and he said, you come down, right? Like that's when you know somebody really went to Sunday school. When they give the you come down. I don't know why we were angry in Sunday school when we did that part. But it's very, very intense. Um, Zacchaeus, you come down. So it, this is one of those stories, right? Where uh, it's kind of like Noah's Ark where kids really, really get into it. Like Noah's Ark, we really love the animals, right? It's a bit of a dark story actually. But we really love the animals. So we like to do Noah's Ark a lot in, in Sunday school. And then Zacchaeus, we like to do a lot. Why do we like to do a Zacchaeus a lot? Anybody know? Because he was short. <laughs> and we kids were short. And we could relate to this short guy. And I vertically challenged, right? It's like, say that right, Pastor. Vertically challenged. And um, I kind of love that we loved that. So here's, here's why to bring that out. You might have heard this story a thousand times. And you might think that you know everything that there is to know about this story. But I think there's going to be some things in God's word that surprise you today as we walk through this again, because this is the final one that we chose to be at the very end of this series, and hopefully the reasons are going to become clear to you. So Zacchaeus, the first thing you have to know about him besides the fact that he's short is he was the chief tax collector in the town called Jericho that he was in, a chief tax collector. And at that time, like, we don't like tax collectors right now, amen, right? Even in this culture, but in that culture, it was an especially big deal. Why? Because they were under Roman occupation, the Israelites were. I, I mean, Rome had, had invaded, they had conquered, and they were going to have to pay taxes to Caesar, not for the beautification and support of their own land, but for somebody else's wealth. And people don't like that very much, right? And so Rome, the way that they would collect taxes is they sold a tax booth, kind of like a franchise. And if you bought the franchise to collect taxes in that particular city, you had the right and you had the protection of the Roman government to collect taxes there. The other thing that you have to know about it is that most people in that culture did not know what their tax burden was. They didn't know how much they had to pay. And that worked for the tax collectors. Because anything that they collected for a given individual or family beyond what they had to, they got to keep for themselves. So Rome demanded a certain amount, but Rome would say, hey, you go ahead and collect extra, and you get to keep the extra. Now, people are pure of heart, amen, especially when it comes to money. So, you know, we're so pure of heart that we would only keep just enough in order to pay our own living expenses, right? Of course not. They exploited this opportunity a whole lot, and they were hated for it. So it was, a, it was a way to wealth, but they saw these people as traitors and as thieves. The people of that time did. They were not even allowed to worship in the synagogue. So this quote comes from Alfred Edersheim. I think I'm pronouncing that right. He was a Jewish scholar. He said, the Jewish public can I, the tax collector, was barred from the synagogue and was forbidden to have any religious or social contact with his fellow Jews. He was in the class of swine. That's pigs. He was in the class of swine, and because he was held to be a traitor and a congenital liar, he was ranked with robbers and murderers and was forbidden to give testimony in any Jewish court. He couldn't even testify. His word was not considered valuable at all. If he wanted to go to the synagogue and worship the one true God and receive his forgiveness the way that they did in the synagogue, Nicodemus was, Nicodemus, Zacchaeus was not allowed to. So, okay, so... Let's stop right there. First service, I replaced Zacchaeus with Nicodemus about four times because when I get excited, I don't think very much. And, and you've noticed that, right? And, and they sound kind of similar. So here's the deal. In sign language, Z for Nicodemus or Zacchaeus is Zorro. Give me a Zorro really quick right there in your seats. So, okay, if I screw this up anymore today, you're just going to give me a quick Zorro, okay? Can you do that for me? Can you help me? Is everybody good? Okay, you're going to help me on this. Okay, so, so he was shunned, Zacchaeus. He was shunned. 
He was ostracized. He was shamed. Dare I say he was canceled. He was canceled by his culture. Cut off from everything. Don't we do this? It's important to pull this into modern day language, right? Not just so we can be hip and controversial. But we got to pull this into modern day language because we've got to call this thing what it actually is. Because sometimes we look at the, the, the current controversy about canceling people and we think of this as something that's new. It's not new. This has been going on for a long, long time. And it's been going on with religious people for a long, long time. Where somebody does things that we think are out of bounds and we shun them and we cut them off. And that was going on in Zacchaeus' day. And it goes on now, doesn't it? Here, here's the thing I'll say about canceling people. and I don't care what language you use for it. At the end of the day, it's law. And at the end of the day, what we're attempting to do, and you can call it consequences, you can call it um, accountability, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people what we think they deserve. And that's what's wrong with canceling and shunning and ostracizing and shaming people. Because the Christian gospel says that all of us are sinners before a holy God. Amen? All of us are sinners before a holy God. Therefore, none of us sit in the seat of judgment against anybody else. And in our lofty holiness say, you're the one that should be shunned, not me. Because that's always the thing unspoken right after it is not me. You should be canceled, but I shouldn't be canceled. You should be canceled and the rest of us are good. The problem with cancellation is, is that it's law and it's not grace. That's what's wrong with it at the end of the day. And our culture may change the name of this thing in five years. I don't know. But what you need to know as a follower of Jesus Christ is we are people of grace. We are people who have received grace from God. And we should give grace to other people no matter what you call it. And so Zacchaeus was canceled. And let's be real. He probably deserved to be canceled because we're about to be told he was a very wealthy man. This is in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. It says that Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through. Now, you might know Jericho has its own history in the scripture, and I won't get into that. But by the time we get to, to Zacchaeus's day, Jericho had become a very, very wealthy city. And the reason was because there was, a, there was a balsam forest right around there, and they sold this very expensive wood and certain oils, and this became a, a trade hub, and there was a lot of wealth in this particular city. So Zacchaeus had not just chosen to be a tax collector, he was a tax collector in a wealthy city. And that's good for business, amen? Verse 2, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy, and he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead, and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus, since Jesus was coming that way. A bit of an embarrassing strategy on his part. You're this important, wealthy guy, and you're going to climb up in a tree like a little boy. There's something about when we seek God, sometimes we find ourselves getting humbled along the way. Do we not? Do we get humbled along the way? And sometimes we have to receive that humility that we walk through. So who was Zacchaeus here? Number one, he was a tax collector and he was canceled because of it. He was a chief tax collector. It's the only time that phrase occurs in scripture, chief tax collector, probably because it was such a wealthy area, it was such a large area that there were multiple tax collectors and he was chief among them. Next is he was wealthy, which means he was good at it. Next, he was short and he was vertically challenged and because of that, he couldn't see Jesus. Just a really quick question. Why didn't the tall people move? Right? Like, it's because they hate him. Right? Like, if you're in a crowd, right? Like, you line up to get your picture taken with a big crowd and they're short people, you don't keep them in the back. Amen? Or you're on the side of the road and the parade's going by and you got little kids, you don't keep them in the back. Tall people, you know there's an etiquette to this thing, right? You push those short people up front. You let them see. They don't let Zacchaeus see. 
because they hate him. But he wanted to see. He wanted to see. Some of your translations say he was seeking Jesus. Very, very powerful. It's very, very important to the story that you know that he was seeking Jesus. We're going to ultimately see that Jesus was the one seeking him. But he was trying to seek Jesus. And because of that, a lot of really cool things happen. Why? If Jesus is coming into town and he's this bad guy and he's been canceled, he's been shunned, all this kind of stuff. Why when Jesus comes into town, why would he climb a tree to see Jesus? Why would he even want to talk to Jesus? I think the reason is, I'm just guessing here, I'm guessing that the reason is because this is late in the ministry of Jesus, and by this point, Jesus had a reputation. He was someone who was kind to tax collectors and sinners, and it was well known. If you're a note taker today, Luke 7, 34, Matthew 11, 9, say that Jesus was known as a friend to tax collectors and sinners. And he was often criticized by the religious leaders for eating with tax collectors and sinners and being so kind to them. Why was he criticized for that? Because when culture has canceled somebody, you're not allowed to accept them. Again, not so different today, is it? Verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, and that's, that's at that sycamore tree, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, you come down. Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So this is, this is actually the miracle moment in our text today. Jesus knew his name. How? How did Jesus know this guy's name? Like, all throughout this series, here's what we've done. Like, we've been talking about Jesus doing some physical miracle in the physical universe, and it was this very big thing, proof that he was God, right? Walk on water, raise the dead, all that good stuff. But we chose this last text very, very purposefully because Jesus does something here very interesting. He utilizes his God-like miracle power, and he uses it for no other reason than to connect with a person. He calls him by name, and there's no reason that he should know his name. Even if he knew that there was some tax collector that we all hate in the town, how would he necessarily associate uh, Zacchaeus with him? How would he look up in a tree and know that it was him? How would Jesus just know? It's the same reason he knows all of us, and he knows all of our names. And you see this throughout the Gospels. There's a moment when he sees Nathaniel. Do you remember this? And he says, I saw you while you were under, under the fig tree. Because Jesus could just see somebody and read their mail. He just knew. And he walks up to the woman at the well, and she's talking to him. And he says, yeah, I know about all your past marriages, and I know how they all broke apart, and I know how broken you are even now. And he just tells her everything about herself. And that's what she does. She, she, the, the woman at the well, she goes down to her town. Remember how she, she went and she preached to the people at her town? She says, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. And it wasn't just his miracle working power to tell her what she did. You know what it was really about? He told me everything I ever did, and he still accepted me. And he still loved me. See, that's that critical combo that always happens in the Savior so when Jesus looks up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, that one word, that's an amazing miracle. And it should stir you today. Because Jesus is going to do everything through the rest of this passage to connect with someone who has been shunned. And it's the exact thing that they need. They need to not be shunned by somebody. And Jesus is about to love them. Another huge thing. So Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. Did you notice that? He doesn't say, let's go grab coffee, I'm buying. He doesn't say, come to my place. He invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. That's important. But he does it not off to the side in a private conversation. He declares it in front of the crowd. Again, this is like a massive crowd parade situation. Zacchaeus couldn't see up over their heads. So there's a lot of people around, and all these people are unified in one thing, that they've shunned this guy. And Jesus, in front of all of them, invites himself to dinner. What do you think that does for his reputation? 
What do you think that does for his status? It's massive, right? So let's keep reading. So all the people then saw this and began to mutter, verse 7, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner, the crowd's mad. Which you saw that coming. You knew that's exactly what they were going to do. How dare Jesus do this? Like we drew a line and we said we were all on one side of the line. Zacchaeus was on the other side of the line. He betrayed us. And Jesus doesn't agree. Jesus erases the line. You could see it like that. Now, what's about to happen for the rest of the story is there's going to be a scene change, and the scripture isn't going to tell you that there's a scene change, but you're going to see it in the text. So they were there at the sycamore tree having this conversation. And after that, they're going to be at Zacchaeus' house, and they're going to have dinner together, and they're going to talk. And you don't really get told that there's a scene change, but you'll see it here in just a second. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood up, and they're at his house now, and when he stood up, the Greek there for stood up, it's like you've, you've done a formal act, like you've stood to commit to something or to proclaim something is, is the essence of that phrase. So Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So he stands up to make this proclamation. Jesus is there. Probably his disciples are gathered there. This is Zacchaeus' house. They just had dinner. And at first, he calls him Lord. And that's massive, isn't it? He could have said Jesus. He could have said Rabbi. He could have said Savior. He could have said all these different things. But some of you guys know that in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that's a really important thing for us to say to God. Like, if you want to be saved, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says... If you will declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. It's this amazing one-two punch that helps you get there with God. And Zacchaeus has it. He calls him Lord, and then you're about to see his heart change. What does he do with his money? He does two really big things with his money. Number one, he says, I'll give half of it to the poor. That's generosity. That's generosity. So the guy who was a thief and stole all this money, he's now giving half of it away, half, right down the middle, to the poor. He's a philanthropist now. The guy who was a taker all of his life has now become a giver. Like, that's amazing heart change that's going on right now. If you know the book of Luke, which is what we're in, in the chapter right before this chapter, Jesus had gone to a person, his, his name was the, the rich young ruler is what he's called there, the rich young ruler. And Jesus had said, why don't you sell your things, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. And that person had walked away sad because they weren't willing to part with their stuff. And so Luke puts that story right next to Zacchaeus and says, no, this, this guy had the heart change. So he's going to give half to the poor. And then what's the second thing he's going to do? He said, anybody that I stole money from, which I'm guessing was a lot. Anybody I stole money from, I'm going to pay them back four times the amount. What's this? This isn't generosity. This is making amends. This is saying anybody that I'm broken with because of my actions. I'm going to try to approach that relationship. I'm going to try to make it right. Amends. This is also restitution. This is also reparations. You're like, pastor, you can't say reparations because that's a political word. Don't care. Reparations in its purest form means simply that I am trying to repair a relationship. If it's got political connotations, argue that over there. Right here, there are times when we break relationships. Even, even you, you folks have been through the 12-step program, you know one of those steps is that we're going to make amends and we're going to repair the relationships of the things that we've broken. And Zacchaeus is one of your biggest examples in all of Scripture where he comes in and says, I'm going to do this. Why? Because it's worth reconciling with the town. He doesn't just like entrench himself in his own bitterness, right? And say, how dare they shun me? They suck. Like he could have. But no, he's changed by Jesus now. 
And so these relationships that are all broken apart, he says, as much as it depends on me, I'll live at peace with all men. I'm going to see what kind of healing can come as a result. Are we good? Verse 9, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. I love this because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And just let me walk you through. There's, there's three really important statements here. Today salvation has come. The only person that knows whether or not salvation actually occurs inside of a human soul is Jesus Christ. He knows. And Jesus Christ is present in the room. And Jesus says, salvation has come. And notice, he makes it past tense. And this is super, super important. Some of you guys have come from uh, Christian traditions and church traditions where they told you that you could never know if you're actually saved. That you just have to keep doing stuff for God. And then someday you'll go in front of the judgment and you'll find out whether or not you actually did enough. Not true. Jesus said, salvation has come. Past tense. I can see it. It's done. Why is it done? Because Jesus is dying on the cross for this man, and this man has just experienced the heart change that you see when someone gives their life to Jesus Christ. Has come, past tense. Somebody say amen to that. Like that gives us peace. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. When they canceled him, you're not a real Israelite. You're not part of us. And you're shut out from our religion, and you're shut out from God, and you're shut out from our culture. And Jesus erases the line. He says, no. Abraham was the father of the faith, and this man today is walking in faith. Therefore, he is, and this is an identity statement, he re-identifies him. He is a son of Abraham. Oh! Amen? My goodness. Let's go, Jesus. Everything is, everything is so carefully chosen. There are no accidents with the way our Savior walked through his ministry in this world. I love that. One of the questions you might have as you're going through that passage, I, I had this question, is what happened at dinner? Right? <laughs> it feels like we kind of it feels like we got the sycamore tree, and it feels like we got after dinner, and it's like the heart changes happened, and the altar call clearly happened already. What happened in between? Why isn't it there? I think the reason it's not there is because it's not important, and I think that's Luke's point in the way that he put that story together for us, is he could have given us those words. But we might be tempted today to look at the words and say, look, it was the words that got Zacchaeus to where he needed to get. And it wasn't the words that got him there. What was it? It's Jesus' presence. It's what Jesus had done at the tree and come into his house. It was all the things that Jesus had done relationally connecting with this guy. That had gotten through to him. And that messes with us a little bit because we're like, man, he needed a Sunday school class, though, for real. Like, we needed to teach him the Romans road, right, and the four spiritual laws and the bridge illustration, and we, we needed to walk him through all this stuff. It's like, nope. It's not what happened. You know how limited his theology, his theological understanding was in this moment, Zacchaeus? And yet he experiences this massive level of heart change. And I love that. And Luke's kind of coming in and saying, it wasn't about the words. He was just changed. How do we know Zacchaeus' name? We talked about this a few weeks ago. Sometimes we get somebody's name randomly in the Gospels, and, and, and they're named, and it's not just like, oh, that Roman soldier. It's like we got this particular person, and why do we get that? And sometimes there's a reason for it. Sometimes it's because this person has gotten saved, and they've become a leader in the new first century church after Jesus ascended. And so Clement of Alexandria, who's one of the early church fathers, wrote that Zacchaeus became a very prominent Christian leader in the first century and ended up as a pastor of the church in Caesarea after this. 
Now, that's not the Bible. That's church history. So that's a maybe. Can I put it under the category of maybe that happened? But that's still pretty cool to think about, isn't it? Here's part of what I get out of this really, really important story. I think many of us have gotten to a point where we have become invisible in this life. See, you remember Back to the Future? What a weird show, right? You remember Back to the Future? And Marty McFly goes back and, like, they do a bunch of bad stuff in the past, you know? And he's carrying around this, like, Polaroid picture of his family. And you remember how they, like, fade out? The more m- mistakes they make back here, it kind of, they kind of fade out. They kind of grow more and more transparent, like, little bit by little bit by little bit. Again, weird part of that story. Not at all reasonable, but I think we go invisible. And I think Zacchaeus had become completely invisible. And I think this is the piece for us. What do we mean? How do you get invisible in this life? So I've got some ways. The the very first one that I'll give you is um, we use our image management skills, don't we? Like, the guests are coming over. We got to clean the house. They can't see the pile of dirty laundry. They can't see the bad stuff. So we clean it all up. And they don't see the real us. They see a a modified version of us. And because of that, the real us isn't fully visible to them, right? Or it's like we take the five pictures and we we put the, the best one, the one with the right pose, and everybody's smiling. That's the one that goes on Instagram. And so what what we do is we put out there an image of ourselves, not the real thing. And so what's happened to the real thing? The the real thing's meant to be a little bit faded back here. And that's okay, right? Like, we all do that, and it's not like it, it, you know, suddenly destroys our souls to, like, do that with our Instagram pictures. But in small amounts, maybe. But what happens when we fall into a rut and we fall into a pattern, and that's how we live our entire lives? is everything has to be conditioned and cleansed for anybody else to see, and we make our entire life that kind of a way. It's very isolating. It's very lonely. It's exhausting. The next way that we make ourselves invisible is that we utilize those manners to get through the day. Someone asks you how you're doing, and you say, I'm doing fine, which is fine (laughs) that we would say that. Right? Like, I don't think at life group you should say I'm doing fine. I don't think at church you should say I'm doing fine. Unless you're late to my sermon running in, and then you should do fine and go right along your way. But, like, sometimes, sometimes we're on our way into the grocery store, and we're late, we got to run, and all this kind of stuff, and somebody stops us right there and says, how you doing? And you have to give them the fine, right? Like, you can't do the 10 minute, here's everything going on in my life. And I totally get that. And so we've got these little manners, and we get these little etiquette rules that we give ourselves just to kind of get through the day, don't we? And that's okay. You just can't live like that all the time, or you become more and more invisible in this life. I mean, how many friends do you have anyway? You've got church friends, and you've got work friends, and you've got neighborhood friends. Some of you guys have got hobbies, and you've got friends in those hobbies. Some of you guys have got kids, and all the all the parents of the kids and the different organizations, you've got all those friends that are there. You've got Facebook friends, and you've got old friends and distant friends and used to be friends, and you've got all these. How many friends do you actually have? And you can't keep connected with all of them, right? You can't go deep with all of them. You'd be exhausted, right? And so what do you do? It's like we keep ourselves at a certain level of shallow with everybody on purpose because we have to, to survive. And that's okay. But what happens if you take that little strategy and you apply it to all your relationships and you become shallow in all of them? Well, now you're invisible. Next, circumstantial distance Circumstantial distance is about the fact that sometimes we move. Sometimes we have to move because of a job opportunity. Some of you soldiers of PCS, and you just know this one really, really deeply. It's like I had a bunch of really solid friendships over here, and I had connection, and I had support system, and then I had to move to a new place. And guess what? It's like restart of everything. 
and you go through so many restarts and you come into a new place and it's a little bit tempting to just not really put the work in to restart for real. That's totally, that's totally human. But the end result of that is nobody where you are knows you and knows what's going down with you. And again, you live an invisible life. Next one is you're on the margins. Maybe you've got medical issues that are isolating you right now. Maybe you're a caregiver for somebody else. And so you're not really involved with any of your people right now because you're giving 99.9% .9 of yourself to this particular individual. You know, Linda, my wife, uh, interprets for the deaf, and it's like it's been wild for me to understand deaf culture and to understand that, that, that the lack of communication can isolate that group of people so much and why it's important that we as a church reach into that culture and reach into those, those people because they're worth it, amen? But that lack of communication can absolutely isolate them and make them invisible to us. Some of you guys have got this, this kind of isolating experience when it comes to race, when it comes to culture, when it comes to mental health issues. All, all kinds of things can separate us more and more from people. See, it's, it's not just one of these things that makes us invisible. It's the combination of all of them together, and we become more and more faded. Aren't we? And then you've got somebody with like such a deal like, like, you know, Zacchaeus here, and, and he's actually canceled. And you're like, well, nobody here has been canceled. Really, have you, were you the one who cheated? Is there family that's canceling you right now? Are you the one who divorced? And you've been canceled from a certain portion of your life. You're the person who went to jail. You're the person who did that thing. And all of it pushes you into this dark corner where nobody knows you. And I'm not trying to do a sob story. I'm just trying to talk the truth here. This is kind of where we are. On a scale of 1 to 10, how invisible are you today? I'll give you a second. It's this cute little children's story, I think, has got a whole lot of bite to it for us. Because I think about us and I think about our culture and I think, I think we've gotten used to invisibility. And it doesn't make it good. Okay, so what's Jesus do? Let's stop talking about bad things. Let's talk about good. What does Jesus do? I think there's a set of things that you can do for someone who's invisible to see them and make them visible again. The first one is obvious. He knows the guy's name, amen? And he walks right up and says his name. And you want to be known by people? They've at least got to know your name. If you want to make me visible again, you better know my name. Like that's just part of it, right? Matters. We got a lot of coaches, got a lot of teachers, got a lot of people who do a lot of things. But man, when they know our kid's name, and we see it, and there's special attention given, the lights turn on, and everything gets different, does it not? It just does, and Jesus knows our name. So just John 10, 3, it's not on your, your uh, screens, but it says, to him, to the, the great shepherd, the doorkeeper ke opens, and the sheep hear Jesus' voice, and Jesus calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Jesus calls us by our name. He knows all of our names, and it matters. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even in the book of Revelation, it says that you will be given a new name by God. Did you know that? It's one of the perks of getting saved and ultimately going to heaven is God's going to give you a little white stone. And it's going to have etched into that stone a new name that God gave you and you alone. And you're the only one who will know that name. And God will know it. That's how individual you are to him. You got to know my name. You got to know what matters to me. You got to know what matters to him. See, Jesus honored Zacchaeus in front of the whole town because he knew this was the secret sauce for this guy. This was exactly what his broken heart needed in order to feel loved, feel accepted, brought in. So Jesus gave him that. How do we do that? Well, we got to know people if we're going to do that, don't we? Like, that's, that's more than like a five-second conversation with somebody. 
my son Jake was in the hospital. He had had surgery, and, and the hospital stay turned into six days, and Linda and I were there all day long, every day, trying to take care of him until he was fully healed from that whole thing. And I had this guy, CJ, a friend of mine, called me up and said, hey, I'm bringing you food right now. I'm stopping off at this restaurant, and I'm bringing you and Linda the food that you guys like. And he just stopped, and he brought us the food. So he knows I like food, amen? amen? And he knows what restaurant I like, what food I like. And he knows I didn't need one more person just saying, hey, if, if you need anything while you're there, give me a call. He just brought it, right? It's like, I, I, need, somebody, I need somebody to know what matters to me and to give me what matters to me. There was this old Sunday school teacher, Carol Oliver, at, at a church that we used to attend when the kids were in grade school and, and Carol, when they, whenever the kids came through her class, like, like sh they would just go deep and they would do all this fun stuff as they, they learned the Bible together and she would even take them to um, Cubs games and, and um, stuff outside of church and, and things like that. Well, why, why take kids outside of church and get to know them outside of church? Because you, you see a different side of them than you do on a Sunday morning. And so all of our kids remember Carol Oliver and what she did. And even in GSM and our student leaders right now, do you know how, how many of the student leaders I hear about on a regular basis? People like Zach Griffin and Michael and, gosh, who else? Laura Trenum, Nicole Visagote, Jordan McKesson. I could go right down through the list of all the people that I hear about on a regular basis. Why? Because they take the time to get to know my kids. What do you think that does to me? Because it takes time. And you might hear that and you're like, okay, it takes time. But pastor, that, that kind of freaks me out and it kind of stresses me because this feels like one more task to do and I don't know that I have time to do this for everybody. And I would say you're exactly right. You don't have time to do this for everybody. Jesus walked into a very, very large city and he went to one guy's house for dinner. That means a whole lot of people did not get dinner with Jesus. Jesus. How many people got out there and filled out a survey that night on Yelp? <laughs> Savior of the world came through town. I didn't get dinner. Very unsatisfied. <laughs> right? <laughs> how, do, how does Jesus deal with that? Like 60 minutes to do an expose. We're all the children of God. Shouldn't we have all gotten dinner? It's a tragedy that we didn't all get dinner. Let's talk about dinner. It's, it's an essential part of the example of love of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he was only able to connect with so many people and work so many miracles and have an impact on so many human lives while he was on this earth. And that's not a disappointing proposition it's, it's the idea that we're supposed to relate to that because some of us, and I know we're in deep waters right now, some of us are in a place where we hear this, this story and we see how Jesus connected so personally and so deeply and, and you're like, well, my, my life's kind of about me and it's about kind of my legacy and my goals and my business and all this kind of stuff and I don't really make it about other people so I feel convicted and this is a good day that I feel convicted that I should be a little bit more focused on people. Amen, that's great. But some of you are already really focused on people. And you're so focused on people that you have empathy exhaustion. And you've got so many people in your life that you're trying to connect with and stay connected with. And what you end up doing because of that, because it's like, oh my gosh, every time a, you know, a cat video plays and it's like the big eyes and stuff like that, I want to adopt a new cat. And we do the same thing with people. And our culture is like, look, another crisis. Another group of people you should feel sad about. I'm like, I'm just bleeding all day, every day. And where's the balance? Have I lost you? Here's the deal. Here's where all the peace comes back in. I look at this world and I look at all the people in it, and I say the only solution to all of their needs is from God the Father, not from me. Because I may have pastor in front of my name, but does, that does not make me a superhero. Doesn't. Jesus is. 
And sometimes there's people that I can't reach out to and I don't have time to touch and it breaks my heart. But those are the moments where I stop and I remember he's their savior, not me. Oh, you codependents out there like me, you people pleasers like me out there, you got to hear this today. You got to hear that Jesus walked into a big city and he served one guy. And he walked away with peace in his heart. Why? Because that was the one the father had said he was supposed to interact with. And some of us, we do that, and we go a mile wide and one inch deep on all of them, and we don't know why we don't actually know our kids at the end of the day when we're so involved in ministry. God gives us focus. Like, we're going super, super deep into, like, how do you connect with a person in a way that actually matters? Guess who's first? Your spouse. They're first in this list. And then your kids. And I don't care what other ministries you're signed up for or how involved you are in the community, you better go deep with them. Dads, date your daughters before someone else does. Moms, take your sons hiking before everything else in their life drags them away from you. Know them. Know who their best friends are. Know what they're wrestling with. Go all that kind of a way with them in relationship. Teach them what that's like because Jesus understood it. And you're like, but that means I can't do everything. I know. Woo. I wasn't supposed to spend that long on that point. You got to know where I live. Jesus went to his house. It just, it sounds so easy. Jesus went to his house. He was the wealthiest guy probably in that city. And he was accused of robbing every other person. When Jesus went to his house, what do you think Jesus saw? He saw all the trappings of wealth. Gold-plated everything. You know, big old pool in the back, probably Olympic size. Right? Big screen TV at Zacchaeus' house. Come on. Right? Every way that you walk into somebody's house and you know just how rich they are, like he had all that. So when he's up in the tree and Jesus is like, I'm going to come to your house today, I think there was a part of him that's like, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know I want you to see all that. Because everything they're all accusing me of, I think you're going to see the evidence of all of it. You're going to go right into the epicenter of the darkness here. Jesus, you sure you want to see this? But Jesus had to. He had to see it. You can't, you can't accept somebody unless you know just how deep the rabbit hole goes. And it's the people who know how deep the rabbit hole goes in you. And if they've accepted you, they can make a difference. But if you've not shown them, not told them, if they've not been there, you've got to go to their house. There's a guy who messaged me on Facebook on a Friday night. This is just some weird kind of situation, but he, was, he had been years sober, and he was, he was binging that night, and everything was falling apart in his life, and he, just, he sent this random note out to me and said, hey, I'm doing this just so you know. Would you pray for me or something? I, I forget what. And I wasn't preaching that week, and I had a little bit of extra time, and I just felt like God was in it, and God, Father was giving me focus and said, no, you got to lean into this particular situation. So the next day, Linda dropped me off at his house, and I went in, and we sat on card table chairs and surrounded by empty bottles and cans of beer. And he's looking at me. He's not, not really happy that I'm there. But we talked together, and here, here's the thing is when I, I could treat him like a brother and I could speak words of affirmation into who he is, and, and who he is basically was not that moment. It was not what he was doing. Who he is was something else. When I said those words, how much extra authority do you think I had? Because I was there, and I saw it. And we got to see in each other before we can accept each other. Jesus had to see his house before he said, salvation's come here. And he's a son of Abraham. Amen? He had to see it. You got to know what I've done, and you got to know what I can do. Jesus called him a son of Abraham and reinstituted him spiritually. That's the final thing. You got to speak life into people. 
And you can't come up with random identity statements and just dole them out to folks randomly. Can you? That's dumb. You actually have to get to know a person and you got to get to know what their identity is and then you got to speak that life over them and that's massive. So one of our worship leaders this morning, several of them, this is a really weird morning. <coughs> several of them, they got the message from God before we came into our prayer meeting this morning. I think three of them had gotten something. And God just does that, right? He, like, he knows what's going on. He knows what the needs are in a church like ours on a day like today. And sometimes he just starts speaking to people and just giving us an idea of what's happening. And one of them got a dream last night. And the dream was is that they were standing on the stage as a worship leader and they saw all of you sitting here and you were all in prison jumpsuits. A sea of orange. <laughs> I won't let you think on that. And you know what a prison jumpsuit is. It's, it's, it's this statement of, I've done a bad thing, and therefore I deserve to be confined. I deserve to be in bondage. And a lot of people walk into church saying, I've done a bad thing, and I'm completely invisible in this life. And there's a lot of bad stuff that I experience every single day, and it's because I deserve it. And I'm pretty sure God sees me that way too. And that last part's where it's at. And I'm pretty sure God sees it that way too. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. So I quick thumb through Revelation. And there's this scene where a whole big group of people is around the throne of God. And they're all in white robes, perfectly white robes. And... John gets confused. John, who wrote Revelation, he's getting the vision. He gets confused, and he's like, where did all these people come from? And the angel says, well, they came through the Great Tribulation. And, and he's like, and they all took their robes, and they washed them in the blood of the Lamb. Do you remember this? They washed them in the blood of the Lamb, and so they're white. What does that mean? It means, it means they weren't white before. I wonder if they were bright orange. You think? I don't know. But they got to wash him in the blood of the lamb and they were white and pure not because of anything that they had done but because of everything that he had done for them and that's our destiny we serve a god who comes right into the lion's den of our house and wants to see all of it and says you're a son of abraham and you're loved and we got to do that would you guys stand You know, if you're, if you're invisible today, get into a life group where you can be known. That's what those are for. If you're teaching Sunday school or GSM today and your kids are just a group, make them individuals. And if you've been doing so much and you've not even gone to that spot with your family, Go to that spot with your family. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, God, that you're not judging us this morning. You're not giving us speeches this morning. You're just coming to our house. And you want to know it all so that you can forgive us. What power, what amazing grace you have, Jesus. Thank you that you are alive, God. That you are alive in this room and in this space. And I pray that we would surrender our broken lives to you right now. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.